As I want to do during this time of year, and it's not only for all of you, but it really is also for myself as well, and that's to remind us all that we should have our hearts and our minds laser focused on Jesus Christ during this season. It's so easy for us to miss that. It's so easy for us to forget about Jesus while, while the other things of the season all vie for our attention. And the stress, the stress that comes with this season is staggering. For most, it's a financial stress. Not having the money to buy any gifts, maybe. Or going into crippling debt. And they find that out in January and February. Or it's the stress of juggling who we visit and when we go visit them. Or maybe it's the stress of how we know those family gatherings usually turn out. But yet the world, the world, in the midst of what the world has turned Christmas into, tells everyone to celebrate. Celebrate the season. Happy holidays, everybody says. And then we also see on Christmas cards and decorations the word joy. Joy. Sadly, there are many in this world that don't know what joy is. They don't know the joy that's connected with the birth of Jesus Christ. They don't know the hope that he brings. They don't know the joy of forgiveness and reconciliation with God. Which is all the more reason for us as ambassadors of Christ to be laser focused on the gospel during this season. Always be prepared, the Apostle Peter said, right? He told us always be ready to give the reason for the hope you have in Christ. Listen to these words from the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, who said this about Christmas. He said, this is a season when all men expect us to be joyous. We compliment each other with the desire that we may have a merry Christmas. Some Christians who are a little squeamish do not like the word merry. It's a right good old Saxon word having the joy of childhood and the mirth of manhood in it. It brings before one's mind the old song of the waits and the midnight peal of bells, the holly, and the blazing log. I love it for its place in that most tender of all parables, where it is written that when the long-lost prodigal returned to his father safe and sound, they began to be merry. This is the season when we are expected to be happy, and my heart's desire is that in the highest and best sense, you who are believers may be merry. Merry, like the prodigal, joyous, filled with joy and celebration. May the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ cause us to indeed be merry, to be filled with joy during this season. Now this morning, as we continue in the carols, we will be looking at the theme of joy, the joy found in the birth of Jesus. But before we do that, we're going to turn to the word of God and we're going to let his word that's been given to us through the Apostle Peter settle into our hearts. So we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 9. This is the word of God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen. Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word into our hearts this morning. May we all receive that word. May we all let it settle into our hearts. May it transform us. May it renew our minds. And may we go forth filled with joy, knowing the salvation that you have given us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you might be wondering why we're launching from that passage. It's because Peter does a masterful job of summarizing who our faith is in and why. 
And from there, he reminds us that when we really meditate on the gospel, we're filled with inexpressible joy. This is the joy of the Christmas season. This is the joy that we celebrate in the birth of Jesus. He is God incarnate, God with us, God who saves. And his advent, his arrival, means that God has come to save mankind, to reconcile mankind to himself, and to usher in his kingdom forever. The two carols we'll consider this morning that speak of this joy are good Christian men rejoice and joy to the world. And as we've seen in the other carols we've looked at in this series for the past couple of weeks, that there's a lot of wonderful theology baked into them. Now, interestingly, Good Christian Men Rejoice is actually a very old melody going back to the early 1300s. It was written in Latin and German back then and then translated into English by John Neal in the mid-1800s. You might remember that name. He's the one that translated O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Each of the stanzas begins with the same refrain, which is this. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. We think of the commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that, that Jesus said was one of the most important. And that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. And it seems like the hymn writer understands that there's great joy in loving God. Almost like it's an essential of who we are to the point where it's simply part of our vocabulary. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. Rejoice with all your heart and soul and voice. And yes, by the way, with voice, we're called to sing. We're called to sing praises. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 105 to sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Yes, tell of all his wondrous works through song and through worship. Tell of the glorious work of Jesus on the cross. Tell of the wondrous resurrection of Jesus from the tomb. Tell of the awesome ascension of Jesus to his throne. And tell of his miraculous birth. Give heed to what we say, the song goes on. News, news, Christ is born today. Christ is born today. It's like we sing it twice because it's that important. Christ, the Son of God, the Anointed One of God, the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Savior, yes, God incarnate, the second but no less glorious person of the Trinity, born in a manger. That's where the carol goes next. Next line, ox and ass before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Now let's talk about the inclusion of the the ox and ass in this carol, because actually there is significance to that. The tradition is that Jesus was born in a stable that most likely had farm animals in it. And so we wouldn't be surprised that there was probably an ox and a a donkey in there. But why include it in the hymn? And why an ox and a donkey? Why not a cow and a horse? Some of the early church fathers, like, like Origen, who lived between 185 and 254 AD, saw an interesting connection in the nativity story with scripture. So what they saw was this, the ox in the Jewish dietary law was a clean animal and the ass was unclean. In Deuteronomy 22, the law says, do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. So they were not considered equal. They were completely different. The Bible is clear that the, the gospel was preached to the Jew first and then the Gentile. And Paul goes on to tell us that all are one in Christ Jesus and that there is no Jew or Gentile. So the early church fathers saw this in the context of the nativity. The Jews are represented by the ox and the Gentiles are represented by the donkey. Jesus brings the Jews and Gentiles together. Jesus unites Jew and Gentile. The church is united in Christ as both worship him. The hymn writer here captures this by saying that the ox and the ass both bow down before him. Now, how about that connection? That's pretty cool. (laughs) The second stanza sings out, Now ye hear of endless bliss, joy, joy, Jesus Christ was born for this. The gospel message is a promise of endless bliss, paradise, as it were. Jesus told the thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. The Gospel of John tells us that those who believe in Jesus, although they perish, will have eternal life. 
The Apostle Peter, we heard earlier, said that there's an eternal inheritance waiting for those who have faith in Jesus. Eternal bliss, eternal blessedness, eternal paradise, eternal joy. And the song goes on with, He has opened heaven's door and man is blessed forevermore. Now this is rooted in the fourth chapter of Revelation, where the Apostle John is ushered into the very throne room of heaven. And he says this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. It's through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ that the door of heaven is opened because he is the door. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus taught to go through the narrow gate. In Hebrews, we read, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. So this endless bliss the song sings of is paradise in heaven, into the throne room of heaven that can only be entered through Jesus Christ, the one who we have put our faith in. There is no other way. And the songwriter says, Jesus Christ was born for this. This is why he came. He came to open that door, which brings inexpressible joy, as Peter says. The third stanza declares the hope that we have. It says, now you need not fear the grave. Peace, peace. Jesus Christ was born to save. There's no fear of death for the believing Christian. Though you perish, you will have eternal life. To be apart from the body is to be with Christ. We have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But to the lost in this world, there's a great fear of death. There's no peace about it. They might shrug it off. They might make a joke about it. Or they come up with some sort of rationalization about being in a better place. Some acknowledge God and they'll say he, he takes out these scales and if the good outweighs the bad, they're in. Every religion of the world looks to some sort of a paradise, some sort of a mecca, some sort of a nirvana, and shows you how you can do good in order to get there. The problem is, what do they do with the problem of sin? They don't. All have sinned and fallen short. There's no one who seeks God. All are destined to an eternity apart from God, and we call that hell. But while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The Son of God, who knew no sin, became sin. He took it all upon himself. So again, there's only one way. It's through Jesus. And Jesus made that way possible. Mankind is called to repent of their sin, turn back to the living God, acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, the risen Christ, and surrender to his lordship. And then there is no fear of death because Jesus conquered it. He rose from the grave. And those that believe that are saved from the wrath of God and eternity in hell. Jesus Christ was born to save those who would believe from all of that. And that message is for all. The gospel's for all. The carol goes on to say that. It says, calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting hall, to be with him in the place he has prepared for us, the everlasting hall, joining all the voices together, singing worship and praise to him. So yes, Christ was born to save, and that gives all of us reason to rejoice. We turn our attention now to that classic Christmas carol, Joy to the World, written by Isaac Watts in the early 1700s, around 1719, they say. From what I gathered, Watts was, a, was an interesting man. He was uh, like a naturally born poet, and he often spoke in prose. <laughs> he became a pastor of a large independent church in England because he was a nonconformist and wanted to avoid the, the state church. <laughs> A man after my own heart. <laughs> he published a collection of hymns, which included this one. His goal in his hymns was to adapt the singing of the Psalms. Now, that's what the Reformed Church and the Puritans focused on back then. They believed that you had to sing from the Psalms in church. But he adapted the Psalms through the New Testament language. So, for example, Psalm 98 
begins with the word, Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things, and that all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And later in the psalm, we read the words, Let the sea resound in everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Now, if we also recall the words of Jesus said to those who wanted him to quiet the crowds, remember as he was coming in and his uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he looked at them and he says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now, all of that between Psalm 98 and what Jesus said, it's all echoed in one line in this carol. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Psalm 98 concludes with the words, Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. And we heard this morning from John chapter 1 that they saw the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. The carol ends with grace and truth and makes the nations prove the glory of his righteousness. So we can see how the, how the Psalms and the New Testament is woven together through that carol. Now, but now as we look at it, it's going to become quickly apparent that this carol is really more prophetic in its nature because it looks more to the second coming of Jesus, to the fulfillment and completion of what he will do. Starts off with joy to the world, the Lord has come. Amen. Emmanuel, God with us. He has come on that first Christmas night. And he will come again. No question. Let earth receive her king. Yes, indeed, Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. We know that. But the world in Jesus' day, much like the world today, didn't recognize him. Nor did his own, the Jews, receive him. Let earth receive her king. They didn't. The church has, but that came by God revealing the truth of who Jesus is. Peter looked at him and he says, you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, God revealed that to you. Paul wrote they were saved by faith, and that faith is a gift from God. It's not something we came up with. And John tells us that to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, as we look to the future, the world will receive her king. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It will happen. And the song declares, he has come. Receive your king. And, and you think about it, that's what we're encouraged to do. We, we're going to encourage the world to do that by proclaiming the gospel to them. They need to see their need for a savior, believe upon him, surrender to him, and receive him as your king. That's our message. The song goes on, let every heart prepare him room. Now that's an interesting phrase. Let every heart prepare him room. Why was Jesus born in a stable? Why was he laid in a manger? Because there was what? There was no room at the inn. There was no room. Nobody had room for him. Just like today. In the prideful heart of mankind today, lost souls have no room for a savior. No one. They don't see the need. They don't want to be a Jesus freak. They don't want to give up all their fun. <laughs> but to those who receive him into their hearts, they are children of God, and they will step into the glories of his kingdom. Now we continue. The, the song says, And heaven and nature sing. That night... Heaven sang of the glories of his birth. The heavenly host appeared in the night sky above the shepherds and sang glory to God in the highest and on earth peace for those upon whom his favor rests. But did the earth sing? Did the world sing? Did everyone break out into song? No. No. Did nature change in a way that manifested praise of God? No. Nature, if anything, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, Nature's groaning. Paul wrote this, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And that's from original sin. Adam and Eve were put out of the garden and into a world that was fallen. And that world, nature, continues to groan. There's still decay. 
There's still poisonous poisons in this world, and there's still death in this world. But it will be restored. It will all be restored with a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And then all creation will sing for joy and heaven and all of earth will sing for joy. Now this ties into the second stanza that declares the Savior reigns. Yes, he does. <laughs> Absolutely. Jesus reigns. He's reigning right now. That hasn't changed. All the authority that was granted to him, he still has. None of it has been taken away. That hasn't changed. We look around us and we can be tempted to think he might not be the king we thought he was. We look at what's happening in the world today. But rest assured, he is. He's still on his throne. That has not changed. And he will return. And when he does Everything will be restored to its initial created order. And then, as we saw earlier, fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains, they'll all sing for joy, as will we. Now, the third stanza is truly looking forward to the return of Jesus. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. So again, when he returns, there'll be no more sin and no more sorrow, bringing believers great joy and bliss. And thorns won't infest the ground. The curse from Genesis 3 will be lifted, and all of nature, as far as the curse is found, the song says, all of nature will rejoice. And it ends with, he rules the world with truth and grace. Now we saw where that came from earlier, right? And the Apostle John told us that they saw him and his grace and truth and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. Every nation, every nation will have to acknowledge what the Apostle John wrote. We have seen his glory full of grace and truth. There will be no avoiding it when that day comes. When he returns... When the Son of Man returns in glory, every nation will have to declare that he is Lord. And we'll see the wonders of his love. There are many wonders of his love because it's actually indescribable. Right from Psalm 63 that says, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. Psalm 36, how priceless is your unfailing love, O God. Psalm 86, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Psalm 118, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Romans 5, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The wonders of his love. This is what we have to look forward to. It all looks forward to his second coming. And as we sing these carols today, the joy that they speak about looks back to the joy that came with the arrival of the incarnate God in Jesus Christ. The joy that, that God has delivered on his promise to redeem mankind from the fall, to restore mankind. There were some back then that recognized it. Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, Zechariah, Elizabeth, Simeon, the Magi. They recognized it. And the carols sing of that joy. That same joy is experienced today in the heart of the believer. We know the risen Christ. We know that our salvation is secure in him. We know that we have no fear of death and live with expectant hope of eternal bliss with him. We know him. So the joy in these carols isn't only celebrating the past joy of his birth, it's celebrating the current joy of our birth, our new birth in him. And these carols look forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the joy that will come with that, the new heaven and the new earth, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the glory of God illuminating everything. There's great joy in that. And we have great hope as we sing these carols during the Christmas season. And so as Spurgeon said, we can indeed 
we can indeed have a merry Christmas. We can indeed celebrate like the returning prodigal. And as Peter said, we can know and we can look forward to inexpressible joy in Christ. We can know that now and we can look forward to it. And so, good Christian, rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Rejoice because the Lord has come and the Lord will come again. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, <laughs> we do have inexpressible joy. We may not always express it, <laughs> but we do know the joy that you have given us. And the joy we have is indeed a gift from you. We know that we have no fear of death. We know that we have no fear of anything. If God be for us, who can be against us? And so, Lord, as we go through this season, let us, let us recall the joy experienced by those that were in the manger that night and the shepherds and all that were there. Let us just experience their joy. Let us also experience with that through our new birth. You, you have filled us with your spirit. You've saved us from our sin, from the wrath of God. Let us live rejoicing over that. And also, as we sing these songs, let us look forward to your return. May we have a constant hope, a hope of things that we're assured of, an expectant hope that you will return, and it will be an incredibly glorious and joyous event. So, Lord, keep us focused on you. May our hearts and our minds stay completely laser-focused upon you. And as you put people in our lives in the coming weeks, may we listen to your words and speak them and utter them so that you can speak into their hearts. I pray, Lord, there are many who you will reveal yourself to during this Christmas season, many who will become saved, many who will be drawn to you, many who will worship you, and that your kingdom would abound. We give this all to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.